दिया बाजू छाना बिलोरी लगला बिलोरी का खा झंडिया बाजू छाना बिलोरी लगला बिलोरी का खा नाक की नथुली I'm delighted to invite our viewers to the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in Shimla. And with me is Shimla's leading expert and chronicler, Mr. Raja Prasim, who has a long association with the Institute. And uh, both of us are working on a project together called Towards Freedom. Because as you all know, this building, which was the Viceregal Lodge, became the, the presidential a uh, mansion for the summer time. It was called Rashtrapati Nivas. And the presidents of India would come here uh, during the summer break. And here is our founder, President Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, who turned a part of his estate into this institute of advanced study. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Professor Paranjpe, it seems to be a good moment for us to move a little into the purposes. Why did Dr. Radhakrishnan choose number one to create the Institute of Advanced Study and why did he decide to locate it here? Well, as you know, he was himself a great scholar and uh, in his visits uh, to uh, Shimla, he found that in the roughly 23 years of, uh, or 18 years rather, of uh, independent India, that is still 1965, the presidents of India had stayed here for less than about 250 days, around 250 days in the 18 years. Throughout this period. Throughout this period. So about, well, about 24 days or so per year at the most. And so he realized that uh, because there was another estate at Mashobra, uh, he thought that this place could be put to better use. And in a way, he wanted to turn the seat of imperialism into a seat of scholarship. And uh, in, in the articles of our memorandum of association, uh, he mentions that his wish is to have a place somewhere in India, like All Souls in Oxford or the Center for Advanced Study in Princeton, where uh, scholars could come, spend a length of time here reflecting on the deepest issues that concern the future of humanity. We must remember that it was a time of the Cold War. Yes. And we had just come out of a war with Pakistan. So it speaks to the vision of a person like Dr. Radhakrishnan, as well as the Education Minister, M.C. Chagala, and the others involved, very eminent, first director was Nihar Ranjan Rai, Professor Nihar Ranjan Rai, uh, that they conceived, even in times of privation and national emergency, of a place where uh, you, know, you could produce research of international quality on issues concerning humanity. The human condition. It's interesting that this thing which comes up is that now we are in a place where, in, on one hand, as we talk about moving towards freedom and the paths to freedom, that we are in, the one, in one place where on one hand you have people who want to hold on to the power. In the same place you have the people visiting it who want, to rel who want them to relinquish that part, and at the end of the day, so to say, the end game comes up, is how we summarize that transfer of power and what freedom really means to us today in today's context, the great sacrifices, the great work which happened in all those years which finally led up to our country's independence. It's also interesting is that uh, which perhaps you're the best person, there's no way that there's somebody else who can talk about it. The great work and the fine work and the quality of the work which has been done by the Indian Institute of Advanced Study through the years of its existence, its publications, its seminars, the many distinguished people it has had which have been visiting it, which have stayed on as scholars, and which 
At least one would like to think if, however humbly, they have added to the corpus of human learning and human literature. Would you like to say something about that, sir? Oh, absolutely. I think we are proud that of the many different kinds of government institutions, I think it is IIES which has uh, sort of lived up to its potential, at least partly. We have pr produced more than 500 uh, internationally renowned publications, books, We've had hundreds of conferences here, and I can tell you, I was uh, reviewing our history, and I found that there's not one major Indian scholar or writer or professor of note in the last maybe 50 years who has not visited us at some point or the other, either as a fellow speaker, participant in our conferences, or as a distinguished visitor, or as a you know Tagore Memorial uh, lecturer or a Radhakrishnan Memorial lecturer and uh, you know here are some of our books published by the Indian Institute of Advanced Study they are for sale here in our bookstore also available online through Amazon and Flipkart and this is just a small variety of the uh, you know different kinds of work we have done mainly in humanities and social studies but in, in fact in all uh, realms of human uh, I would say knowledge, almost all realms, except experimental sciences. We've got books on mathematics, you know, on, on the history of science and technology as well. And that is our library, which has more than 150,000 volumes, uh, including some archival material. Because as you said, this whole business of transfer of power is, is a matter of, uh, what should I say, not just historic uh, interest, but of, it's a living concern for us because, Absolutely. you know, the three bloodiest lines uh, that were etched uh, on the maps of this part of the world, I would call them, uh, you know, uh, signs of uh, uh, not just a political but cartographical um, uh, dissection or division were, of course, the Duran line, which marked the border between the British Empire and the Afghans. Uh, Afghanistan, and it's still a porous boundary, yes. as we know, and still extremely blood-soaked. And then the McMahon line, stretching all the way from Ladakh and going to Arunachal Pradesh, which demarcated British India from Tibet. And of course, the worst of them, the Radcliffe line, which I'm told that Radcliffe had a place here, but he chose to sit in the United Services Club and do most of his work. Uh, but uh, it's an irony of history that somebody uh, who never went to these provinces to see how the people on the ground live, you know, drew that map and you know the disastrous partition. I know you're writing a book on it, but I'm always reminded of Toba Takes Singh, that great yes. short story by Manto, yes. Yes. where this uh, Sikh uh, goes mad because he doesn't know whether he's in India or Pakistan. and. Uh, uh, in fact, in the end, he stands up on a tree, uh, so, you know, and then shouts uh, about the absurdity of these shadow lines. Absolutely, sir. But it's a beautiful building, as you can see, and it's the first building to have electricity in India, a fire system, the naphthalene uh, pitch, uh, you know, uh, links at the top were supposed to melt. There are water storage tanks on top. This is Burma teak, and the impress of the arms because it was an imperial building. These arms have now been sent to Rashtrapati Nivas, and instead we have bouquets and books. But maybe we should uh, move Let's out. Let's That's a good idea. Thank you. So we are moving towards the porch of the building, and uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Vaseen about, uh, as I walk out, about, uh, you know, how this building came to be built. It's built in, uh, in a form of uh, granite, the hill itself was shale rock, and it had fissures which were filled with concrete. But as we move out, I'm going to point to the architect of the building, uh, Henry Arvid. And Mr. Hakeem will tell us a little bit about this building and about the man who designed it, and also the man, Lord Dufferin, who built it. So let's maybe swing around and have the building in the backdrop. Okay, okay. Should we do that? So why not? Why not? Uh, of the many great grand imperial edifices which uh, the British built in our country, 
And I do like using this phrase, often enough I may say I wear it to death at times, you can do lots of things with other people's money. This is a wonderful case in point. <laughs> we paid for it. But uh, all that said and being that said and done, the history behind this building and the events which have unfolded here have been absolutely remarkable. The first set of architects and the first set of engineers which started out on this building, the, it didn't work out very well. They are examples of how the foundations of certain retaining walls were actually narrower than the top and expectedly they all fell down. It was only after the imperial circle of uh, the CPWD, the Central Public Works Department was created in Simla, that, uh, Henry, of which Henry Irvin was the first superintending engineer, that work began on building this uh, building. The idea of creating a far grand, a grand residence for the Viceroy had originated with Lord Lytton, but nothing came, came about uh, at his, during his tenure. His successor, Lord Rippon, was a rather Spartan man who was very happy with the country cottage of uh, what, what Peter Hoff was described as. But Dufferin, on the other hand, had this great love for grand castles. He wanted to build one on his Irish estate, but he didn't have the money to do it. He'd served as the Governor General of Canada before coming to India. Canada did not have the money. When he came to India, he set about building what one anonymous writer at that point of time referred to as a joy and an expense forever. So that joy and expense is behind us as we stand here. And uh, Ironically, I don't think uh, he got to use it because Lansdowne was the first uh, governor general who he was few, few months. months exactly. It was just a few months because he was desperate to live in it, which is why Despite its seeming solidity, there is uh, an intrinsic, there are, I won't say intrinsic, but there are certain parts of this building which are structurally weak because it was just rushed in order to make, to fulfill Dufferin's desire to live in it for the last few months. And he only lived in it in the last few months of his tenure in 1888 which is when this building was also complete. But what is remarkable in the in, of this entire building is the Burma teak uh, panelling. And this is again a very telling tale of what imperialism, the story of imperialism was l like at that point of time. This panelling is almost, uh, you could say, a mnemonic for a far wider a malaise which afflicted uh, the world at that point of time, which stemmed out of this great desire of acquisition and plunder. Uh, plunder. Uh, they always say that we follow the money trail, follow the money trail. Exactly, and the cash crops will take you there. The cash crops. Opium, tea, coffee, cocoa, sugarcane, and uh, you yeah, see the yeah. history of uh, antique, as you said, will show the history of colonialism. Uh, just another thing, the so-called public entry building that we see over there was added later, around the uh, 1920s. Uh, and uh, uh, this tower also, uh, it was Lord Curzon who found that the tower was dwarfed uh, by the rest of the building. Of the rest of the building. Exactly. The earthquake of 1905. Exactly. So he raised the height. And the other thing, to go back to what Mr. Vasin was saying, that let's remember that this building was constructed before the railway came to Shimla with its famous 103 tunnels. And so, when this hill was flattened, it was the native coolies on their kachars and donkeys who brought the stone from the uh, nearby areas. So the sweat, blood and toil of Indians uh, went into this building before the times of, uh, uh, you know, JCBs and uh, cement mixers uh, and so on uh, and therefore it's also a huge challenge uh, to maintain this building it's a bit of a white elephant I must say but uh, uh, wouldn't you say that of the many grand buildings of Shimla uh, several have burned down including Peterhof so it's incumbent upon us uh, Barnes Court is still preserved but uh, uh, you know, 
uh, of the many grand buildings, this is one that we should uh, particularly try to preserve as a national monument. But uh, to go back to your earlier point, why don't you take us back to the early days of Shimla when Lord Amherst came here and uh, the so-called Kennedy Cottage was built and uh, uh, the circumstances uh, why the British chose this as their uh, summer capital. I'm just reminded of one little incident in, in Lady uh, Emily Eden's uh, work. Her brother was the Viceroy, yes, Lord, Auckland. Lord Auckland, and they came here and uh, she met uh, Ranjit Singh Ji, the Maharaja uh, at that time. And uh, when she came here, it was beastly hot, she said, yes. you know. Yes. <laughs> So the weather can be a bit changeable and I, I remember another vice dean later called this a kind of sport, a hideous monstrosity or something like that. Several, I, <laughs> and in fact most of these, the people, the incumbents, very few of them had uh, words of praise to say for the architecture of the building. They all used those uh, phrases and words like grand, impressive, uh, but uh, also which words which don't really say very much or speak about the quality of the building. Yes, it was grand, yes, it was impressive, but also, as they said, was a telling waste of space everywhere. The legacy, which is something which I always like to speak about or something, especially when we're standing here, sir, at a place like this, is that these may have been built by a colonial power, but at the end of the day, it was Indians who made the building. It's on our land, it's paid for by our money. If it belongs to anybody, it belongs to India. The architectural designs may be from wherever, but then India has always been very syncretic. We've always been very welcoming of other ideas. This is what is the uniqueness of our I society. I completely agree. I think this building is as much India as the great uh, temple Brihadishwara in Tanjore or as the Taj Mahal in Agra. This is also a part of our history and, and our legacy. And I'm very happy that despite many attempts to turn it into a seven-star hotel, to liquidate it, to, you know, just make it a tourist spot. Uh, and you're, a, you're an expert in tourism. Uh, in spite of all that, uh, we've still managed to preserve this uh, building for the purpose for which President Radhakrishnan intended it, Absolutely. which was the Indian Institute of Advanced Study. And uh, I want to now ask you a little bit about the famous people who walked this way and up this road, including Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Maulana Azad, the frontier Gandhi Khan, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, Sardar Patel, uh, and let's go back to those times when the transition between imperialism and uh, nationalism was at its height, but between imperial India ruled by the British, the British Raj, and uh, uh, our own struggle for freedom uh, had reached its peak. Maybe we can uh, go to the 1940s now. Can you tell us about I'd that very time? happy to, sir. Um, as uh, Professor Paranjpe was just saying, this is a building which has witnessed the coming and going of several people, people which have defined the idea, which have defined our country the way it is today. These were the men who fought for our freedom and also gave it the essential character which remains with us very substantially to the present day. Mahatma Gandhi first came to Simla in 1921. He had come straight after the, this was a thing when, it, when the Rawlat Acts was, had just, was still there. These extremely repressive acts and uh, the Jallianwala Bagh incident had just got over. Uh, it was a very troubled time for India. It was a time when we as Indians found it increasingly, we found an increasing sense of betrayal by the British. We had sent this huge army to fight in the First World War, a war that wasn't ours. Uh, we may have agreed with it, but had we been an independent country, able to make our own choices, it would have been a very different uh, situation. But we were dragged into a war which wasn't ours. We lost close to 80,000 of our men in that war. 
And what do we get rewarded with? We get rewarded with a massacre on unarmed people. We get rewarded with uh, the Rawlat Acts. But Janiawala Bagh, sometimes I've been asked, is that would you define and pinpoint one single event which heralded the end of the British Empire? I put it down to the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. For the first time, the Raj lay stripped of all its veneer, of all its trappings, and showed what one man with power, with authority, with a gun in his hand could do. Rightly, wrongly, whatever his justifications, whatever the eyewash that was put over it in later years, the fact remains it was a, ma a massacre of unarmed men which will stand, I mean, in one of the uh, most horrendous events which have taken place in the history of mankind. Even Churchill, sometimes regarded as the arch-imperialist, referred to it as an event which stands in singular and sinister isolation. That is how horrifying this event was. Uh, I will come now to move on to the part where we will be talking about a little bit with Professor Makaran Paranjpe on the history of Simla and then as we move on to some other parts of the building. Chum 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 kere maat ke bhi. 